Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kim, and this is Marco. And our talk today, we'd like to tell you about our adventure of analysis and optimization of the Linux networking stack. Um, we both work for Intel in Ireland. So, <laughs> has to be done. Just a bit there. So I'm just going to give a bit of an introduction uh, to our project. Uh, I'll tell you our use cases. And then I'll discuss the BIOS, kernel, and system settings that we found improved the performance for our setup. And then I'll hand you over to Marco, and he will take you through the benchmarking results and discuss the next steps. So our main goal was simply to enhance the out-of-the-box performance of the Linux networking stack. Um, obviously, there are these kernel bypass technologies like DPDK, but I mean, if we all wanted to bypass the kernel, none of us would be here, right? So um, our main goal, yes, was to just improve the performance and then also to provide um, a set of guidelines for anyone else that wanted to do something similar. And we plan to include any BIOS and kernel and system settings that we found improved our network performance. All of our tests were done with Linux running on bare metal, but the same tweaks should apply to uh, virtual, uh, virtualization um, VMs and containers with a little bit of extra tweaking. So for our tests, we focused on L2 and L3 and on the TCP and UDP protocols, um, although we do plan to extend that to STMP in the future um, for some telco use cases. Uh, the packet sizes that we tested with were 64 bytes up to jumbo frames, and we included an IMIX profile as well um, to give a more realistic um, example of what network traffic might look like. Um, so we measured throughput, latency, and scalability um, from the networking side, and then we also uh, measured some performance <laughs> metrics such as CPU utilization, for example. So our testing procedure basically involved, first of all, we'd clone or pull from NetNext, and then we'd modify either a BIOS, a kernel, or a system setting that we had found through or expected through research should improve the performance of the network stack. Um, and then we would, depending on our use case, use either um, Ixia IX network or iperf to run our benchmarks. And once we obtained the results, we would then compare them to previous test iterations and um, continue to modify our settings until we had a best known configuration for both of our use cases. So these use cases, we had two. Uh, the first was to treat the platform as a network forwarding node, and then the second was to treat the platform as a network endpoint. In the forwarding scenario, uh, we used Ixia IX network to forward traffic to a port on the platform. Uh, the traffic was then routed to another port on the same platform on a different subnet and sent back to Ixia where the throughput and latency were um, calculated. In the endpoint scenario, uh, we had iperf client running on the platform and sending packets to a 40 GBE port on that platform um, with a particular IP address iperf server was bound to that port, and so when the packets arrived, uh, we were able to determine the throughput and latency. So there was a large number of BIOS, kernel, and system settings that we found improved our performance. Um, and through the testing procedure that I previously mentioned, we obtained a best known configuration for both of the use cases I just mentioned. In terms of the BIOS, uh, first of all, we disabled hyperthreading. Um, the reason for this was that we were affinitizing uh, each OREX and TX port queue uh, to one CPU, so one queue, one CPU. Um, but the presence of the secondary logical core when hyperthreading was enabled meant that that queue wouldn't be able to fully utilize the CPU it was bound to. In terms of turbo boost, we also disabled that because the erratic frequency hikes can lead to quite unstable performance results. Uh, we disabled p-states because obviously we didn't want the CPUs going to sleep when they weren't doing work. And we disabled p-states as well so that uh, the CPUs were running at maximum frequency and voltage at all times. A Little bit of a disclaimer, we were only interested in network performance. So um, if you disable all of these and then you find that your CPU burns out after a year and you have a really high electricity bill, don't blame me. Um, we found that there was only one kernel setting that needed to be changed from the default. Um, this was preempt none. So basically, um, we disabled any kernel code preemption, uh, which is ideal for good throughput. 
and there was a large number of network core IPv4 affinitization and NIC settings that we changed using the PROC file system and ETH tool. Uh, I unfortunately don't have time to go through them all now, but we do have them recorded in the backup slides and they'll be available online after the presentation to anyone who is interested. So I'll now hand you over to Marco and he'll take you through the rest of the presentation. Hi everyone. So um, just briefly on, on the setup, uh, we were using a high end desktop, which looks like more as a server. It's a three gigahertz CPU uh, with 64 gigabyte of RAM. Uh, and we were using the i40e uh, Intel network card, which is the most known as Fortville. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we, we did use two form factors of the, of the network card. One was the uh, 4 by 10 gigabit, and another one was the 1 by 40. The rationale behind that is uh, in the forwarding scenario, we had some logistics problem uh, in the lab using the IXEA setup, so we, we, we had to use the 1 by 40, uh, sorry, the 4 by 10, uh, while in the endpoint scenario, we just because we were using two, two desktops connected to each other, we, we were able to use the uh, 1 by 40 gigabit. Uh, <clears throat> a little bit of the methodology, uh, each test case we ran was running for between 30 and 60 seconds depending on which test we were focusing on. Uh, uh, the throughput used for each packet size uh, is, uh, is the average over the total uh, runtime. Um, and usually the, the CPU idle time was taken around 10, 15 seconds in the test where basically the the full test will, was fully loaded and all the flows were running uh, and we were kind of sure that the, uh, at, that, at that point the CPU was kind of handling as much as possible. Um, again, this is just like very briefly uh, about some settings that we had. As Kim pointed out, we have all this documented in our backup slides and in, in the paper. So from a command line perspective, from, from a boot grab perspective, uh, we disabled the P states, uh, we disabled the IPv6, we had enabled the transparent huge pages together with the huge pages support, uh, and we isolated uh, the CPU zero to basically, uh, you know, so that all the uh, system interrupts, all the system uh, handlers were basically uh, running on CPU zero. And because of that also other tweaks uh, were done, for example, to use um, the CPU zero only to handle, for example, the uh, management port of the desktop. Um, another thing we did, uh, just to have much more control on, on how the frequency was uh, being set, uh, we enabled the user space governor, uh, and it's just more for convenience, uh, and we set the, the CPU frequency speed to its maximum, uh, which is the maximum allowed by this uh, CPU, which was 3 gigahertz. Um, Again, just because uh, this will come up with the benchmarks, uh, what we identify as TCP full offload versus TCP no offload is literally the setting that you can do through the ETH tool dash K command, uh, where you can enable, uh, for example, the RX hashing uh, or the TSO or GRO uh, offloading onto the NIC. Um, and similarly, the no offload is literally having all those options set to off. Uh, something that I would like to point out is that the network card we used has a lot of support for TCP uh, offloading, but it didn't have any for UDP. So there was really not much benefit for, for the UDP use case. So uh, what we did, as Kim said, uh, we stick with NetNext, uh, and the, the rationale is we wanted to, to make sure that uh, any improvement made by all the contributors, we could look at those. And, and similarly, if we had none, anything to, to change, tweak, or contribute, we could do it very easily. Um, the, the, the version is the 440RC3. Um, and in all cases, we are talking about all our optimization that you can find in the paper uh, were all turned on. Uh, similar to what Jamal pointed out earlier on, I would really like to discuss some of these findings later on in the buff, because, for example, there is some discrepancy here when uh, we look at the setting of the MDU sites on the Ethernet uh, between the 1500 and the 9000 9, uh, to support jumbo frames. 
And even for packet sizes that are actually below the 1500 MTU sizes, we actually see some discrepancies in, in the uh, throughput, in the line rate percent. Uh, and we did uh, run these stats many, many times, and we always end up with the same results. It's some weirdness with, which we didn't really manage to explain, just because, as you can see, uh, I would, I would kind of uh, be able to explain if the packet size was between the 1,500 and the 9,000, but it's really hard to me, for me to explain why there's such a discrepancy in, in performance throughputs uh, for packet sizes around 512, for example. Uh, it makes very little sense. Uh, a similar discrepancies can be found also for uh, the TCP use case between uh, an MTU size of 1,500 versus an MTU size of 9,000 on the interface. Then, uh, after that, we decided to, to actually start looking at uh, what if we are able to handle the uh, software queues and having like a schedule that's a little bit more precise uh, that, uh, that can reduce the jitter between operations. Uh, and so we looked at the RT patch, the real-time patch. Uh, first of all, because we were using uh, NetNext, uh, we had to port the RT patch to, to, net, to the NetNext branch, so there was some effort there. Um, and then we, we could actually start benchmarking. Uh, and the findings are actually very positive. Um, so in terms of throughput for small packet sizes, which are like below 700 bytes, uh, the RT patch is actually providing a 3x better performance versus a standard kernel. Um, and similarly, when looking at the latency, we actually observe the same type of, of behavior uh, up to the 1,024 uh, bytes uh, with uh, 2x better latency performance. Uh, in a similar fashion, the CPU idle time uh, of the RT patch version of the kernel actually uh, was much better. Uh, again, almost double uh, the, 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 the number of free cycles versus the, the standard kernel. Uh, and to me, it wasn't a, like a big surprise that eventually the two, um, the two different versions of the kernels, like the, the vanilla one and the RT patch, eventually uh, merged uh, at the uh, bigger packet size just because the number of interrupts, the number of uh, packets that going through the system are actually much lower <coughs> at, a, at a bigger packet size. Uh, this was for the UDP, but um, the, t the TCP use case um, showed exactly the same type of performance from both a throughput and latency perspective and a CPU cycles perspective. As I said at the beginning, we just were not just interested in the uh, forwarding scenarios, but like also in using uh, Linux as an endpoint scenario. So we, uh, we used uh, iperf to, to basically uh, use a standard application that can consume packets, uh, either TCP or UDP. And I, I don't have that slide here, but when we when we were using like one flow, the uh, the throughput at 64 byte packet was 1.75 gigabit per second in the user space, um, and when we were basically moving uh, the application to to use the seven cores, just because one core was just jailed, uh, seven cores, seven flows, uh, the scalability just proved out to be almost linear from 175 to 11.9. Um, What's, what's very interesting uh, here is that we, we did play a lot with uh, the different MTU sizes, for example, to be set on the Ethernet interface. Uh, and as I briefly said at the beginning, um, we have this uh, full offloading, no offloading type of settings. Uh, and we also like um, played with the window size and window scaling. Um, the, 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 as the graph shows here, obviously, the uh, utilizing the offloading capabilities of the network card has a huge impact on performance. Like, um, I, I think the chart speaks on its own. Uh, the, the bottom, the bottom line there is a, is a benchmark done with no offloading at all uh, on the system, uh, while the uppermost is using all the possible um, 
settings and all the offloading capabilities of the network card. Um, but what's also very interesting is, again, uh, very differently than what actually happened in the forwarding scenario here, the MTU set on the Ethernet is actually giving a different type of outcome. While in the forwarding scenario, uh, a smaller MTU was actually behaving better in terms of throughput, in the endpoint scenario, a bigger MTU is actually providing better performance. Uh, and again, this discrepancy, and because we also did the forwarding scenario, we couldn't explain this, and I hope that we can talk about this more in the details <coughs> at the above. Um, so with regards to the next steps, I think our end goal was, uh, was much bigger than what we thought, and uh, we, we, we wanted to, to go down and using uh, perf, so looking at uh, very much into details of what's happening to the system. We didn't manage to, to do that activity before uh, today, so that's definitely like on, on our next step on the radar. Um, because we did manage to uh, benchmark the benefits of the RT patch in the forwarding scenario, we would like to do the same using the endpoint scenario. So uh, again, using Hyperf on a patched version of the kernel using the real-time patch. Um, we are definitely like interested uh, in understanding the empty weirdness that we have observed. Uh, above all, the discrepancies between the two different use cases and why is that. Um, just because, uh, as again Jamal pointed out earlier on, uh, there's a lot of noise made by all these bypass technologies and uh, what they can achieve. Uh, we would like to look into the packet and map option on, on the sockets um, and really understand the benefit of it. Um, and when doing that, we would like to create a standalone application that can actually do some L3 forwarding. Uh, and again, investigate the benefit of the QDisk bypass, which is another option that uh, we have given through the packet map. Um, because these are all these tests are really like uh, baseline tests. Uh, we have a couple of use cases, customer use cases that we are really interested in benchmarking and see how do they perform. So to have a real life scenario uh, where Linux is is being used. Um, and again, as I said. We would like to really start working on our third phase, uh, which is using perf, so looking into the code, uh, identifying bottlenecks, um, which could be logs, memory copies, uh, interrupt handlers, anything really that can either improve or make performance worse. So just because, um, so just because when we started doing this uh, this activity was, I think it was mid November, late November. Uh, and we had a big, big goal in mind. Uh, I think we missed the point of you know allowing us for a lot of ramping up. There are lots of knobs into the kernel that can be tuned, and sometimes you keep tuning things and things get better, and then you hit one <coughs> one value, one setting that actually make everything worse. Uh, so things uh, you need to allow if you're interested in doing this sort of analysis and. Tuning, uh, you need to allow time to understand all the knobs and what's really happening on the system. Um, so, what we found as well out is that uh, a lot of performance benefit can be just um, taken by you know changing some bio settings or taking advantage fully of your system. So, for example, flow affinitization uh, offers a, uh, offers a much um, offers a great opportunity for better performance, uh, better locality of packets, uh, less cache misses. Uh, so just knowing your system and how, how the flows traverse your system actually already helps in terms of performance tuning. So thanks. OK, do you have any question, comment? OK. So can you explain this offloading thing? Is that something the NIC can do? Is it TCP off? Is it a TOR or what, what is that? Is it our TCP polling or? Is it, it's, uh, it's basically the GRO offloading, TSO offloading. Yes, TSO probably. Okay. TSO and TX checks Yeah, okay, that was confusing. All right. So it's TSO. GRO. All right, for a second there I thought you were putting a TOR. 
which is a scene around here. <coughs> okay, any question? Okay, there. Um, so I was wondering, for these tests, were you doing IPv6, IPv4, or both? It, it was IPv4. IPv4, okay. Yeah. So, um, so it'd be interesting to see IPv6 also. Uh, you may find some differences. And one thing I'm particularly concerned about is hardware may have differences. Like, if there's a difference in TSO with how IPv4, IPv6 works, um, that could be kind of critical. Yeah, uh, it's definitely not, doesn't want to be an excuse, but we had to trim our test cases a lot because we identified so many. Uh, and and on, the, on our agenda, there's so many still to be tested, and IPv6 is definitely on the agenda. Well, right, but th think of it this way. So IPv6 is definitely um, growing exponentially, and there should be no question with any vendor now that IPv6 is absolutely critical. So it would be very helpful to see IPv6, probably IPv6 and IPv4, and you may actually discover some performance differences that could be interesting. Thank you. Okay, any, other, any other comment or comment question? There, okay. Two more? Good. Anyone else? I have a question about, uh, you said flow affinity pinning. Do you do that using uh, some specific thing on the device so that it actually maps to a specific core? So it's, uh, it's using a feature from the network card, which is called Flow Director. I see. Who's next? Hi. I just wanted to give a quick uh, feedback or input uh, since you mentioned you want to do SCTP uh, benchmarking as well. Yeah. Um, you will be in for a big surprise because Linux is known to have, well, uh, a very, um, well, slow and uh, uh, um, inefficient implementation of SCTP. So that's going to be an interesting ride. Yeah. Just, um, yeah. Well, the reason why we, we want to look into SCTP is because we actually have a couple of customers that having troubles, so we would like to help. Yeah, I mean, I, I do a lot of work in, in, in telecom, and um, the, the, it, nobody seems to be interested in improving the, the mainline kernel code, and everyone uses an out-of-tree proprietary SCTP implementation because the Linux one just has so many issues. It's very unfortunate that nobody seems to be contributing to the effort and rather just use proprietary stacks. Hopefully this is going to be the, the good excuse Sounds to improve like it. A challenge. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Okay. No, one more. So you mentioned that you used a lot, um, you had some stuff with interrupts. So didn't you configure interrupt coalescing through ETH tool? It, it didn't work well? Yeah, we, we so in, in our paper, we, we played a lot with the interrupt coalescing as well. Uh, through the ETH tool. Obviously, we're using Nubby, but you still have, even with Nubby, you still have all the software queues going, right? Not necessarily the At least in the forwarding case, let's say you have an infinite stream of packets. So at some point, you don't have an interrupt anymore. Right. Uh, but what we've also found out is with, with, the RX, uh, with the RX or TX coalescing, different values were giving us different performance, different benefits. So sometimes you actually get better throughput, and other times you get better latencies. So we ended up with a specific value that you can actually find in our paper to be what seems to be the best, at least. You were using strict uh, moderation? Fixed. Fixed value. Oh, you used adaptive moderation or the just... No, the adaptive was off. Okay. Yes. Yes, of course. So, so the strict one didn't work well? It did. With some values which, if I remember correctly now, is 25 and 75. Okay, so, so in, the, in, the, in the buff later, you'll, you'll speak about the RT patch and what... Okay. Thank you.
Okay, any other comment, question? Good. Thank you. Thanks.